Welcome to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers Top 5 Tank Engines. The engine is the beating heart of every tank. This mighty Challenger, for example, would be an inert, useless piece of iron were it not for its 2 litre, 50 horsepower Perkins engine, unable to move, unable to fight. Because this engine drives the auxiliary generator, which powers the boiling vessel that makes the tea. Cheers. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Every engine should be designed around its requirements. So what are the requirements of a tank engine? Well, it needs to have the right performance. It needs to be small enough and light enough. And it needs to have the right reliability and durability. And these aren't the same things. Reliability is about how often it breaks down, whereas durability is about how long it can run before it needs an overhaul. A good engine design will be capable of being built in large numbers. It'll have a low fuel consumption, a low rate of heat rejection to minimize on cooling requirements. And it might have quite specific needs depending on the engine in question. For example, it might need to be particularly quiet. Well, our number five engine had requirements very similar to that in that it needed to produce less smoke. This is the first engine to be designed for a tank. Our number five engine, the Ricardo tank engine. Designed by a young Harry Ricardo, who later went on to become president of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. The first tank engines created a lot of smoke, giving away their position. Ricardo's engine cured this problem, and it had improved power and reliability. As you can see, it's an inline six configuration. 8,000 of these engines were built and their first use was in the Mark V tank. From the money he earned, Ricardo went on to set up his own company, which still exists today. So this engine's legacy lives on. And for that reason, it's number five in our ranking. Our number four engine is the Ford V8, which powered many variants of the Sherman. And it's got an interesting history, starting life as an aero engine, albeit one that was never actually used in an aircraft. In 1940, demand for the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine was much greater than supply. And so the decision was taken to start building them in the United States. Now, Ford were already building the Merlin in their factory in Manchester, and so it seemed an obvious choice to do the same thing in their factory in Detroit. But Ford were reluctant to build a Rolls-Royce design, and they suggested an engine of their own, which now seems a little naive, perhaps, because it's one thing to design an engine, but something so complex will never be right first time. It needs to be run in on the test bed and out in the field. It needs to be used and abused. It needs to be developed until it achieves the right power and the right reliability. And that takes time. It takes years. But engines were needed urgently. And so the contract was eventually awarded to another Detroit company, Packard. And their Merlin engines were built in the tens of thousands and fitted to aircraft like the Mustang. Ford never found a buyer for their V12, but the US Army did need a tank engine. So four cylinders were taken off the end to create a V8, which took a little bit of time to get the reliability right. But by 1943, this was the US Army's engine of choice for the Sherman and was later used on the Pershing. The Ford V8 is a liquid-cooled engine, so water flows through it to cool down the hot metal. Most tank engines are liquid-cooled, but to see one that's not, let's take a look at our number three choice. 
which was also used on the Sherman. And here it is, the air-cooled Continental R975, a radial engine with its nine cylinders arranged in a circle around the crankshaft in the middle there. <laughs> Now this was already a successful aircraft engine and it's from the same family as the one that took Lindbergh across the Atlantic in 1927. Now this engine was chosen to power the Grant and then the Sherman tank because it was well developed and readily available. And you can tell it's air cooled because of all these fins on each of the cylinders, which allow for a large surface area so that you get maximum heat transfer. And just consider its configuration. If this were an, an inline nine or a V design, those cylinders at the rear wouldn't be cooled sufficiently. But with this configuration, well, all the cylinders are at the front. So you get sufficient air cooling as the air flows across and through these fins. And the advantage of a design like this in a tank is its simplicity. You don't have to have a radiator and all the associated pipe work. So there are fewer parts that can go wrong. There are fewer parts that can be damaged. But on the downside, it's, it's quite a tall engine. One of the reasons the Sherman tank was so tall was because of this engine. And you also need to make sure that your tank design will allow for that sufficient cooling air to flow across all of the cylinders. The limitations of air cooling are when you get to higher powers. Transferring heat from metal to air is more difficult than from metal to liquid. So in a liquid cooling system, you'll have lower temperatures inside the engine. So let's take a look at another liquid-cooled engine with our number two choice, which, like the R975, started life powering aircraft. Our number two engine is the Rolls-Royce Meteor, one of the key factors in the renaissance of British tank design in the final years of the Second World War. The high power to weight ratio of this engine allowed British tank designers to have their cake and eat it. Previously, they'd used engines like the 340 horsepower Liberty here. So designers had a choice. They could have a lightly armored tank with good mobility or a slow, heavily protected tank. Now the Meteor was similar in size and weight to the Liberty, but being more modern, and more highly developed, it could produce 600 horsepower. Designers no longer had to choose between armor and mobility. Now, with the Meteor, they could have both. Used in the Cromwell and Comet, and most famously in the Centurion, the Meteor was developed from the renowned Merlin aero engine. The Merlin had done many thousands of hours on the testbed and had been developed to a high degree of reliability. It had been in volume production for several years and had a ready-made supply chain for all the different components. And that allowed it to become a tank engine with the minimum of engineering work and the minimum delay. The Meteor was in production until 1964 and stayed in service into the 1990s. And so with its long life, and the impact that this engine had on British tank design, the Rolls-Royce Meteor is our number two engine. One disadvantage of all petrol engines, like the Meteor, is their relatively high fuel consumption. A tank's not going to travel far with a thirsty engine. Our number one engine was more efficient, and that is the Kharkiv V2. Designed by Konstantin Fyodorovich Chelpan, it's the engine that powered the Soviet T-34 here. Now, Chelpan was head designer at the Kharkiv Locomotive Factory, and he was awarded the Order of Lenin for designing the V2. However, not long after, in 1938, Chelpan was executed in one of Stalin's brutal purges. Like the Meteor, it's a liquid-cooled V12, but it's a diesel engine, which was a little unusual at the time. 
In the years since the war, diesel has become the fuel of choice for most tanks. And the advantages of diesel combustion is that it's got a greater efficiency and it's a safer, less volatile fuel. Safer to transport and safer to store in large quantities. Typically though, a diesel engine will be bigger and heavier than its petrol equivalent, but the V2 has a compact design and an aluminium block and head, which also lowers the overall weight. Why are diesel engines more efficient? Well, for a start, in a gallon of diesel, you've got about 10% more energy than in a gallon of petrol, but it's also due to the different ways that diesel and petrol combust. So unlike petrol, diesel isn't a volatile fuel, which means that you can compress the air in a diesel cylinder right down until you have a very high pressure and a high temperature. The diesel is then injected into the cylinder in the form of a very fine spray and the diesel droplets in that spray then ignite. Now that very high compression ratio gives you a high combustion pressure and a high expansion ratio as the piston is driven down through the cylinder. And both these factors give you a high thermal efficiency. The V2 has had a long life. Built in its tens of thousands, many Soviet tanks have been powered by its descendants and some are still in production today. High production numbers and a long life are signs of a great design. And that's why the V2 is our number one tank engine. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed our top five choices and maybe learned a bit about the engines that power tanks. Please continue to support the Tank Museum on YouTube and Patreon and perhaps consider becoming an engineer yourself. The world needs more engineers.